Welcome to Module 5 in Periodontology 2. We will cover Chapters 31 and close with Chapter 28, the maintenance of periodontal implants and then periodontal emergencies. Chapter 31, Maintenance of Dental Implants. The components of a dental implant consist of non-biological devices surgically inserted into the bone that replace tooth or provide support to dental prosthesis. The dental hygienist maintains the health of dental implants and must understand the anatomy of dental implants, the condition of peri-implant tissue, the pathological changes that threaten the integrity of the implant, and the survival of the epithelium. They must also be aware of any radiographic findings and considerations for evaluating the health of an implant. The dental implant fixture is surgically placed in bone. Once placed, it performs as a root and provides support to the implant. The structure is made of titanium, which is biocompatible with human bone, and is a poor heat and electricity conductor. Take a moment to study the anatomy of a dental implant. The transgingival abutment post is also made of titanium. This post protrudes through the gingival tissue and provides support to the restorative prosthesis. The biocompatible material of which the implant and abutment are made do allow for integration with tissue and allows for the tissue to heal around the implant. This possesses a similar appearance to crowns and bridges when inserted into the oral cavity. The peri-implant tissue surrounds the implant and is similar to the periodontium of a natural tooth. Differences between the tissue is that the epithelium adapts to the titanium abutment by creating a biological seal. This biological seal creates a barrier between the implant and the oral cavity and forms a natural sulcus around the implant. The connective tissue creates an interface with the implant. Even though this interface lacks cementum, a periodontal ligament, and gingival fibers, protection of the implant still occurs. This is done by the connective tissue fiber bundles oriented parallel to the implant and circulating the implant's abutment. Keratinization of the tissue may or may not be present in the area. Implant to bone interface is necessary for implant success. The osteointegration of bone to implant will not develop a periodontal ligament and is absent of the slight and natural mobility when compared to natural teeth. Successful implants are absent of gingival inflammation and pain. There should be no increased bone loss or radiolucencies around the implant and radiograph. If this is to appear, the implant is at risk and immediate attention is sought. Peri-implant changes may be an indication that disease is present. The accumulation of bacterial deposits may lead to disease and loss of osteointegration. Two diseases are most common, peri-implant gingivitis and peri-implant implantitis. Peri-implant gingivitis is caused by plaque accumulation around the implant. Peri-implant implantitis is evident around the coronal portion of the implant, while the apical portion continues to maintain osteointegration. In the final stages of this disease, mobility is evident. The removal of the implant is recommended when signs of mobility occur to reduce the loss of supporting bone. Major factors involved in the etiology of peri-implant diseases include the host inflammatory response on plaque accumulation. The progression of the disease resembles that of natural teeth, but occurs more rapidly. Meticulous home care is necessary to prevent reinfection of the area. The biomechanical defects of implants is a result of non-existing periodontal ligaments, and the lack of protective structure between the bone and the implant alters how the tooth and bone deal with biomechanical forces, which then cause a direct contact with the bony environments. Peri-implant radiology is used to compare bone levels. The bone height changes of less than two tenths of a millimeter in the first year is deemed successful. Prosthesis should be evaluated for fit and integrity, and radiographs should be taken every year. The structure of dental implants is made of titanium. This metal is soft and can be permanently scratched with metal instruments. 
It is believed that the scratches cause biofilm retention and disturb the biocompatibility of the coating of the implant. Metal ultrasonic tips are also contraindicated for use. Only plastic instruments are recommended at this time for assessment and debridement and specially designed Cybertron tips. Assessment and treatment instruments for implants are commonly made of plastics. Materials must be softer than the titanium implant or the surfaces will abrade. Plastic graphite filler instruments are used on implant crowns and prosthesis, but they cannot be used apically to the margins of the prosthetic crown. Calculus removal is done with ease as there is no interlocking or penetration into the abutment. Only the use of light pressure during debridement is used. Current research on the use of metal scalers and instruments is underway, and we may see a change in their use on dental implants in the near future. At this time, we continue to follow the protocol and use plastic instruments for implant assessment and preventive measures. Take a moment to study the various imp implant instruments recommended for implant care. The use of specially designed cavitron tips are recommended and should only be used on implants. When conducting peri-implant probing procedures, it is not necessary to measure healthy appearing tissue. During the first three months following implant placement, it is recommended not to use a probe and disturb the area. The biological seal is weak and probing may disturb the healing process and penetrate the tissue integration that is underway. Reference baseline data for comparison of healing and future restorative needs as the abutment type that is used. Fixed reference points for probing depths, prosthetic design, and baseline attachment levels, as well as probing depths between 1 and 3 millimeter are measurements used to assess and compare the health of the implant at recare visits. Light probing techniques should always be used. Let's review the guidelines for debridement of dental implants. Do not scratch titanium surfaces or disrupt biomedical seal. Use only plastic instruments. Metal instruments are contraindicated. Instrumentation is restricted only to the super gingival deposits. Short controlled strokes with light pressure is administered and all strokes performed away from the peri-implant tissue. The frequency of implant maintenance is every three months. If healing becomes a concern, a more frequent schedule may be recommended. Signs of problems that may encourage a shorter recall schedule are reduced to bone support around the implant, inflammation, and systemic diseases and may interfere with healing. A physician may be needed to consult if this becomes an issue of implant success as the patient may require medical intervention. Take a moment to familiarize yourself with the various hygiene aids recommended for implant deplacking non-wire interdental brushes, interdental stimulators, floss threaders, and super floss. Floss aids and water picks are among the home care aids recommended for implant patients. The goal of implant maintenance is to ensure the integrity of the alveolar bone support by controlling inflammation for the longevity of the health and function of the implant. The maintenance of implants is similar to the treatment of periodontitis meticulous home care is a must, and the objective of maintenance therapy is to maintain the alveolar bone, control inflammation, and ensure the health and function of the implant. During these appointments, the use of radiographs will assist in comparing bone density and bone height around the implant. Plaque control measures should be reassessed and changes made if necessary. The prosthesis should be checked for fit and assessed for mobility. Maintenance begins with an oral exam to reference previous dental charting of the implant. Radiographs are taken annually and the bone level is monitored for changes. If vertical bone loss of less than two tenths of a millimeter occur within the first year of placement, the procedure is considered a success. During the oral exam, mobility is routinely checked. This procedure should be performed with plastic handles instead of metal and continue to follow the same protocol as natural teeth. Lack of osteointegration causes loosening of the abutment teeth and internal screws. Fracture and prosthetic failures of the components are evaluated and treatment recommended. In care of the implant structure, the abutment should be flossed regularly. Abutments may be constructed of porcelain, acrylic, or composite materials. The crown circumference may be bulky 
or the margins will extend to meet the post support of the implant. The flossing technique is similar to regular crowns and dentition. However, the physical appearance and shape of the implant may differ. Specific instructions to your patients for successful implant flossing techniques and recommendations is necessary. Several devices may be recommended to achieve optimum oral hygiene. In self-care of abutments, the use of standard toothbrushes, power brushes, and interdental brushes are recommended. The interdental brushes may have protective coated wires to use on implants. Tough dental floss, perioades, and daily microbial rinses are also recommended for daily oral care. If patients present with an implant metal bar, gauze squares are recommended for cleaning. Care of fixed prosthetic crowns may be more difficult due to the depths between the abutment and gingival tissue. The use of various cleaning aids to achieve optimum home care is recommended and should be followed by a regimen similar to a fixed bridge. In the care of the removal of prosthesis, also known as an overdenture, the procedures are similar to traditional full dentures. In all maintenance appointments, the overdenture must be removed and cleaned, as well as the abutments. The attached abutment posts are prepared to support the overdenture with O-rings, magnets, or clips. The accumulation of biofilm and capsules is common around the abutments and the supporting bar. Cleaning around an abutment bar may be performed by using super floss, thin yarn, and other flossing aids to sweep under the bar and remove biofilm accumulation. Let's take a moment to view this two-minute video on implant failure. Robert had elected to have his initial implant procedure performed by a doctor who assured him that he could do everything in just one office, including both the surgical placement of the implant and the placement of the final crown. Robert was referred to my office by his new general dentist. Robert had left his previous general dentist because of dissatisfaction with an implant placed by the previous dentist. Our first task was to stabilize the gum tissue by placing a gum graft. We had preserved connective tissue over the dehist implant, so we harvested an epithelial graft from the patient's right palatal area and transferred the graft to that site. We allowed the gingival graft to heal and mature for eight weeks, at which point I once again made entry into the implant site with vertical incisions and full flap reflection. We removed all of the connective tissue from the facial aspect of the implant, and this revealed the poor relationship of the implant to the bone. It required only moderate force with extraction forceps to dislodge the implant. This force was not much greater than if Robert had bitten into a raw carrot. I prepared a resorbable collagen membrane to facilitate closure of the surgical site. The very large defect was then grafted with freeze-dried, decalcified, particulate cadaver bone reconstituted with the patient's own whole blood. After placing the collagen membrane over the bone graft material, the flap was then closed primarily without tension or blanching. At four months, the surgical site was re-entered and the grafted bone was evaluated for quantity and quality. An osteotomy site was prepared with drills and osteotomes and the implant was placed. A surgical cover cap was placed and the flap was closed primarily. After an additional four months of bone maturation and implant integration, the cover cap was then replaced with a wider diameter tissue healing cap. Before returning the patient to his general dentist, the facial tissue was skived, a plastic surgery procedure that created a more harmonious tissue blend. The general dentist performed bleaching on Robert's teeth and then placed a crown on the implant it is evident that a very acceptable prosthetic result was achieved. Our last chapter we will cover in this course is Chapter 28, Periodontal Emergencies. Acute periodontal conditions associated with dental emergencies exist and may be related to periodontal and gingival conditions. Early intervention and prevention can decrease permanent damage to the periosteum. The description of an abscess is the acute circ circumscribed collection of pus in the periodontium. Acute is a rapid onset accompanied by pain and discomfort. 
circumscribe defines a location as a small localized area. Pus is an accumulation of dead white blood cells resulting from the body's defense mechanism to fight the infection. Types of abscesses include gingival, periodontal, and pericoronal. Signs and symptoms include pain, localized swelling, alveolar bone loss, rapid onset, and possible drainage. Areas of drainage are referred to as a fistula and allow for pus to express from the tissue. Causes of abscesses include the blockage of an orifice in an existing pocket. Temporary improvements to surface tissue can restrict access to the base of the pocket. This is theorized that the gingiva will improve but not allow for the sulcus fluids to flow from the base of the pocket, causing the abscess to form. Another cause of abscesses is the lodging of a foreign object in the tissue that punctures the epithelium that remains embedded. The incomplete removal of calculus has the potential to create a periodontal abscess. The removal of only coronal deposits allows for marginal healing. Once marginal healing occurs, accessing the base of the pocket is difficult and restricts the drainage of toxins. Sometimes the disruption of bacteria in a deep pocket causes an abscess to form. This may be due to the advanced periodontal disease, systemic factors, or social factors that interfere with, with healing. Patient conditions can lead to wound healing or aggravate and perpetuate the formation of periodontal abscesses. This includes smoking, poor nutrition, stress, and autoimmune diseases as HIV and AIDS. Gingival abscesses occurring predominantly in healthy mouths are attributed to foreign objects forced into the gingival tissue. They are limited to the marginal gingiva with signs and symptoms of swelling and pain. This condition does not usually affect the adjacent tissue. Treatment involves establish, establishing a path of drainage for the infection and periodontal debridement. Periodontal abscesses occur in pre-existing periodontal disease sites. They typically affect deeper structures of the periodontium beyond the marginal gingiva. Signs and symptoms include swelling, pain, and pus. Treatment requires anesthetizing the area to establish a path of drainage. Periodontal instrumentation and lavaging the site with sterile saline is recommended. It may be necessary to check for occlusal trauma to eliminate this as a cause of occurrence. Antibiotics are prescribed in severe cases and reappointment for evaluation is necessary. Periodontal abscess is a pocket of pus that typically forms in the space between the gums and the tooth. This space is called the sulcus. You may know you have an abscess when the affected tooth hurts when you tap or bite on it. The tooth is slightly loose, the gums bleed, and they are swollen, shiny, and red or deep red-blue. On the other hand, you may have none of these symptoms at all. Many cases of periodontal abscess are caused when periodontal infection flares up in a gum pocket and grows quickly, forming an abscess. Injured gums can sometimes form an abscess when they are infected by bacteria that live naturally in your mouth especially when the gums are already affected by periodontal disease. Impacted food, often a seed or popcorn shell, can sometimes cause an abscess because it prevents the natural fluid in the gums from flushing the bacteria out and also provides fuel for bacterial growth. Once formed, an abscess may drain through the gums, creating what's commonly called a gum boil. A periodontal abscess can cause pain and swelling, and if left untreated, can cause damage to supporting bone and ligaments in a short period of time. It can also lead to the loss of the affected tooth and sometimes even the neighboring teeth. If we suspect a periodontal abscess, we'll perform a thorough examination. We'll use a periodontal probe around the teeth and take x-rays to check bone levels. We'll also look for any pus or discharge. To treat a periodontal abscess, we must drain it and remove the source of infection. We may perform a root planing procedure, which will drain the abscess, along with cleaning plaque from the root surface. In some cases, we may first numb the area and then lance the abscess at its base. Antibiotics, though they can't cure an abscess by themselves, may be prescribed. Home care may include rinsing the mouth with warm salt water or an antimicrobial mouthwash. 
A periodontal abscess should be treated as soon as possible to eliminate pain, stop the spread of infection, prevent tooth loss, and restore the health of your mouth. Endodontic abscesses can be diagnosed by gently tapping on the coronal part of the tooth. Temperature testing and electric testers are also used to determine the vitality of a tooth. Radiographs can be used to identify an abscess, but in the early stages of the disease, it is unable to be detected radiographically. The characteristics of endodontic abscesses include non-vital non or partially vital tooth pulps, bone loss around the apex of the tooth, intermittent pain, and sometimes difficulty in identifying the exact location due to overlapping nerve fibers. Endodontic abscess is a pocket of pus that forms in the jawbone at the tip of a tooth root. You may realize you have an abscess because the tooth hurts when you tap or bite on it, you have a bad taste in your mouth, or you experience pain and swelling. On the other hand, you may be unaware of an abscess because you have none of these symptoms at all. An endodontic abscess begins when bacteria, which are always present in your mouth, infect the inner pulp layer of the tooth and kill the pulp. The infection can then spread from the pulp chamber, down the root canals, through the tip of the root, and into the jawbone. There the pus builds up and creates a hole in the bone. This hole in the bone is the abscess. Sometimes the abscess drains near the infected tooth, forming a gum boil. Two common causes of infection in the pulp are fractured or broken teeth and deep cavities. Both allow the bacteria to get through the enamel and dentin layers of the tooth and into the pulp. Sometimes a blow to the tooth allows bacteria to enter the pulp. In some cases, there is no apparent cause. The abscess creates pressure inside the bone and ligaments surrounding the tooth and can cause excruciating pain. Left untreated, an endodontic abscess can damage the adjacent soft tissue, lead to bone loss, be a continuing source of infection that drags down your immune system, and even be life-threatening. To find an endodontic abscess, we perform a thorough examination, including x-rays. On an x-ray film, a dark area at the root tip indicates an endodontic abscess. We may also use an electric pulp tester to determine whether the pulp is inflamed or infected. An infected tooth will never heal on its own. Because root canal therapy removes the infection, it usually heals the abscess too. Sometimes, however, even after a root canal, the infection continues to grow. In that case, retreating the tooth with root canal therapy or a further surgical procedure called an apicoectomy will stop the infection and restore the health of your tooth. An endodontic abscess is painful and can lead to much more serious conditions. There are differences between a periodontal abscess and an endodontic abscess. The similarities are that the periodontal abscess results from an infection in the periodontium and then involves a pulp. The endodontic abscess results from an infection within the pulp and the pulp becomes non-vital. The treatment of choice is root canal or extraction. Causation is either trauma or tooth decay. Pericronal abscesses are referred to as pericronitis. This is an infection of the soft tissue surrounding any partially erupted third molar. The tissue flap covering the third molar is called the operculum. Symptoms include pain, swelling, redness, tissue drainage, trismus, fever, and lymphadenopathy. Pericronitis treatment includes the following. Drainage of pus through irrigation of the undersurface flap of tissue with saline, pain management, gentle plaque control, antibiotic therapy, and third molar extractions also may be recommended. Reoccurrence is possible without definitive treatment. Pericronitis is an inflammation of the gum tissues that cover the chewing surface of molars that have not fully come into the mouth. It most often occurs with the wisdom teeth, also called third molars. You may realize you have pericoronitis when your back gums are swollen, red, and painful. You may also have a bad taste, pus or odor in your mouth, or difficulty opening your mouth wide. The most common cause of pericoronitis is food, bacteria, or plaque trapped beneath the gum flap. Before a molar comes in, gum tissue completely covers the area. As the molar begins coming in through the gum, 
part of the tooth remains covered by a flap of gum tissue, making it very easy for food and bacteria to get trapped. Infection and inflammation can quickly develop in these hard-to-reach places. In addition, if the upper molar comes through fully before the lower one, the upper tooth may bite down on the lower gum flap, worsening the condition. If pericoronitis is left untreated, a much more serious infection can spread to the neck and cheeks. To determine whether you have pericoronitis, we'll perform a thorough examination. The exam may include probing the gum around the affected tooth and taking x-rays. To treat pericoronitis, we must thoroughly remove plaque and bacteria from the affected tooth and rinse around and under the gum flap. To prevent pericoronitis from reoccurring, we may, depending on the circumstances, surgically remove or reshape the gum around the tooth or even extract the tooth. Home care may include rinsing your mouth with warm salt water or an antimicrobial mouthwash. We may also suggest that you use an oral irrigator to help keep the area bacteria free. Pericoronitis is painful and can lead to more serious problems. It's important to treat pericoronitis as soon as possible to restore the health of your mouth. There are two periodontal necrotizing diseases, one of the gingiva and one of the periodontium. These are acute infections that are commonly associated with patients suffering from a compromised immune system that limits the host infections me mechanism of the body to protect itself. Necrotized ulcerated gingivitis resembles punched out cratered papilla. The pseudomembrane is formation of gray, whitish matter that consists of dead cells, bacteria, and oral debris cover the gingival tissue. Bleeding, pain, lymphadenopathy, malaise, and fever are all common sy symptoms. This disease is limited to the gingival tissue and is known by another name as Vincent's infection or trench mouth, cell death and loss of epithelium covering the underlying connective tissue occurs quite rapidly. Treatment of knot include gentle debridement and supergingival instrumentation for the removal of pseudomembrane coverings. Plaque control and recall appointment for subgingival debridement are common post-operative treatment recommendations. Antibiotic therapy in advanced cases may be recommended. Further assessment of the underlying periodontal disease is necessary once the acute stages have subsided. Rest, fluids, and the avoidance of spicy foods is recommended. Necrotized ulcerated periodontitis, also known as NUB, is very similar to NUG, but it affects deeper tissues of the periodontium and alveolar bone. The disease can be accompanied by bone sequestra, which is dead pieces of alveolar bone present. The treatment is complex and may require medical consultation. Patients usually having serious underlying medical conditions are found to have this disease. Immediate periodontal referral is recommended. Primary herpetic gingival stomatitis is a disease resulting from herpes simplex virus. Patients routinely seek dental care due to the pain involved. The disease is highly contagious and onset can be mild to severe. Two types of oral infections lead to this disease. They are oral herpes and genital herpes. Medication includes antiviral drugs and analgesics. Over-the-counter medications include topical lidocaine or Orobase. Let's watch the following video on the disease. Gingival stomatitis is an infection of the mouth, gums, throat, and tonsils that leads to swelling and sores. It may be caused by a virus or a bacteria and happens most often in children. This picture shows a severe form of gingival stomatitis. The virus that cause this disease include HSV or herpes simplex virus type 1, also known as a virus that causes cold sores, and Coxsackie virus, which is known to cause herpongitis. Poor oral hygiene is also associated with this medical problem. The symptoms can be mild to severe and can include bad breath, fever, general malaise, sores in the cheeks or gums, sore mouth, and a loss of desire to eat, obviously because of pain and soreness in the throat. This picture shows an example of self-inoculation. In other words, this child infected her finger with the same virus due to sucking her thumb. The diagnosis. Examination alone is enough to make the diagnosis. 
Other diagnoses need to be considered depending on the full history of the present illness. A swab and cultures of the throat are sometimes taken to exclude co-infection with bacteria. A throat swab for strep throat is normally done to rule this disorder. Sometimes this is followed by cultures. And on rare occasions, a biopsy can be done on the ulcers themselves to rule out other causes of mouth ulcers. Treatment. Symptomatic treatment only is what's needed. The mouth sores themselves can be numbed using Ambison over-the-counter numbing solution and also other numbing solutions that are used for teething babies. They can be applied directly to sores. Gum sores, you can use glyoxide to the gums up to four times per day or you can use a half water, half peroxide water solution. A soft mechanical diet is recommended to prevent hard particles of food from irritating the sores. Over-the-counter Tylenol or Motrin for general pain and fever are also recommended. Follow-up is very important, especially if there's no improvement within five days. Get prompt medical attention if there's inability to eat or drink secondary to pain. There's fever for more than 72 hours. If there is trouble breathing or swallowing. Or if there's signs of dehydration, like weakness, fatigue, unusual drowsiness or confusion. The oral human papillomavirus infections are associated with pain, swelling, redness, and bleeding gingiva that develops into ulcers and initial vesicle forms then burst into an ulcerated lesion. The area of infection includes the lips, palate, tongue, and gingival tissue. The infection interferes with eating and drinking and in severe cases produces fever, weakness, headaches, and lymphadenopathy. The following video represents current research on HPD. Oral human papilloma virus, a main culprit behind throat cancer, could be associated with poor oral health, including gum disease. Investigators from the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston examined data from the 2009-2010 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Included in the data were nearly 3,500 subjects between the ages of 30 and 69 years. Participants were selected based on their available oral health data and the presence or absence of 19 low-risk HPV types, as well as 18 high-risk HPV types in the oral cavity. The study results indicated that the subjects who reported poor oral health had a 56% increased risk of developing oral HPV infection when compared with those who had good oral health. Individuals with gum disease demonstrated a 51% increased risk of oral HPV infection, while those with dental problems had a 28% higher risk. The researchers were also able to find connections between oral HPV infections and the amount of tooth loss. In addition, the study results indicated that men who smoked cigarettes, used marijuana, and engaged in oral sex regularly faced elevated risk of oral HPV infection. The study authors note that self-rated overall oral health was an independent risk factor for the infection. The link was not found to vary regardless of whether the participants smoked or had multiple oral sex partners. This concludes the audio lecture for this course. This week's discussion board topic will be of your own choosing from case one or two on page 528 in your textbook. Post your response to the discussion board with a 100 word posting by Wednesday midnight. Respond to one of your peers discussion postings with a 100 word response by Sunday midnight. Make sure to respond to a peers posting that is unlike the case you have chosen. Complete the 15-minute Module 5 quiz and start gathering information about your position papers. You should be finalizing the content of your papers this week. This concludes the audio lecture for Module 5.